Hi, I'm Bernie Hallam's co-host of Choir Practice, and this is... What's going on, guys? Kyle Reyes. We are super excited for this episode because we've got a dude that flew from halfway across the country. We're going to get into that and his incredible backstory. Heartbreaking, angering, inspiring backstory. Um, first, we'd like to start off with two things, a couple little shout-outs and, uh, and some other stuff. So... Quick shout out first to our boys over at Warrior 12. Love the new shirt that they sent. That which doesn't kill me had better start running. Um, seems kind of fitting for 2024, right? Where the whole world seems to be going crazy. It is crazy. Uh, another shout out to my boys over at Prey.com. They flew me out to the Indy 500. Super cool experience. Great opportunity. Um, absolutely loved it. And we're going to be doing some partnership stuff with those guys moving forward. They have 16 million downloads. What? God knows you didn't race. <laughs> no, I didn't race. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I, yeah. Oh, I remember. I ended I, your racing career. I crashed. <laughs> oh, poor Kyle kept getting spun out. Every, he had a target on his back. Only once. I only spun out yeah. once. I whiplash, <laughs> hit my head. It wasn't good. But I realized that I'm actually very good at sitting in a suite and having a beer and watching a race. I, I think I found my calling. Um, just incredible organization, 16 million downloads, um, giving a lot of people an opportunity to, to find their faith and grow in their faith. Um, and I wanna give another little shout out. This this little box, Bernie literally said, what the heck is that thing? Um, this is a, a really important part of my childhood. So when I was a little kid, we came from absolutely nothing. Um, we were super poor growing up and my grandpa, um, taught me all about money and he had a coin collection in here and my grandpa passed away a, a few months ago um, but we used to every single Saturday we would go through all the different coins and, and that's how I really learned about the value of a dollar so there was the you know the coins from all different countries and um, after he passed they were selling the house and, and they said is there anything in the house that you wanted um, and this was the only thing that I wanted. I didn't want any of the coins or anything like that. I just wanted this tribute to my grandpa to go up on the whiskey wall because it's, it's in our past, I believe, that we find our future, right? It's in those relationships, those, those moments that really create who we become as an adult. Um, by just looking back and, and remembering those times, counting little coins. And so, Grandpa is going up on the whiskey wall, um, which is kind of ironic because Grandpa didn't drink. But anyway, um, one final thing. We always like to start off with a word of prayer just to thank God for the blessings that we have. And so, Father God, we thank you for this incredible family, this incredible audience, all of the men and women who serve and protect our communities and our country. We thank you for bringing this incredible man halfway across the country to share his story, to help strengthen and inspire others. Lord, we ask you to protect all of our families as we travel, to continue to give protection and strength to, to those who are holding the thin blue line every single day. Father God, please bless us with wisdom and discernment in how to best tell these stories and how to help serve this community. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Who are you? Well, I'm John Mattingly. I'm a retired sergeant from Louisville Metro Police. Uh, served for 21 years. And in 2020, was just unre uh, reluctantly thrown into the limelight over a search warrant that just kind of went bad. You know, went through the door, got shot, and returned fire. And from there, everything just kind of went downhill. And the narrative was totally out of our control and, and got spun so bad that that it just put us in a limelight in a bad way and, and that never got corrected. And that's one of the reasons I'm here is try to put that story straight and help other guys who might be in my position to not be in my position. So I think the best way to tell the story, Bernie, longtime cop, is for you guys to have a conversation about what happened, right? Yeah. The situation, the policing side of things. And then after that, let's dissect the fallout from this a little bit from a, a media perspective, if that works. Yeah. Um, yeah, so take me through preparation for all this what was the, the pc uh, what got you there in the first yeah, place so so the thing people don't understand about this case is we didn't investigate it we were just a hodgepodge group of guys in our narcotics unit that were asked to serve a warrant they had five warrants going at the same time and so it's manpower intensive uh, swat was serving a couple of them and they needed more bodies so they put an email out saying hey can anybody volunteer we've got these locations i looked at the location and said yeah i'll take that one because um, i've been doing narcotics and and violent crime stuff for 
14 years and it was like, man, I'm tired of being down in the ghetto and always doing these trap houses and people coming out and it's just nasty. So I thought this is overtime. Overtime is supposed to be easy, right? Yeah, You're not supposed to do a lot of work on overtime. Yeah. And uh, so I looked and said, well, give me the apartment. That's the girlfriend's house. I'll take it. It shouldn't be bad. I've done, at this point in my career, I've done about a thousand search warrants. Um, so I, routine, man, these are, they become almost where you, you, you try not to get relaxed in them or used to right. them, but man, it's so hard when you do it over and over and over. And I've been shot at, we've had to shoot people, but not to the extent or the magnitude that this happened that night. Um, so the whole reason we were even at Breonna Taylor's house, that's what we're talking about, Breonna Taylor. Um, and if you remember her, it was Breonna Taylor in March, Ahmaud Aubrey in April, and then George, George Floyd, Floyd in May, and everything just kind of came together and yep. exploded. And it was horrible. Um, and people, the emotions that were played on people is what got us to this point. And so the reason they were even there at that house, the reason the people who wrote the warrant had the PC was Jamarcus Glover was the target of the investigation. He'd been locked up. I think he had six active felony cases in Jefferson County at the time, but they just kept catch and release, catch and release, catch and release. All of them involving guns, all of them involving violent crime or, or narcotics. And so this time, and Brianna had just bailed him out two months prior. Okay. She bailed him out. She used her address as his, gave her phone number as his. His registration came back to her house. His bank account was at her house. Um, his cell phone came back to her house. Everything that pointed to her was through his name. Um, that's the reason they were there that night. And they knew she probably didn't have dope there, but they thought, well, maybe there's money, documents that can kind of tie us into the rest of this organization or this crew that can kind of tie it together. Um, so when they asked us to go there that night, we did. We showed up. And uh, the, the brief was kind of, I don't want to say weak, but it wasn't what we normally do because there's so many people, so many moving parts with SWAT hitting these, us hitting these, that we like we didn't get the layout of the apartments. Um, and so when we got there and we, and we went up on the door, everybody's talking about a no-knock warrant. Not the case. This was a knock and announce. It was originally signed as a no-knock, but because of, of the predicate that takes place with, with the no-knock, has a lot of things, but mainly a lot to do with the person you're going after. Okay. And so they knew Jamarcus Glover. By the time we got to the brief at 10 o'clock on that Thursday night, they knew Jamarcus Glover was not going to be at that house. He was down on Elliott, which were the main houses. And they had a tracker on his phone, peeing on his car, or a, a tracker on his car, peeing on his phone. Whole cams up. They knew where he was going to be. He was under heavy surveillance. Right. Yep. So they said, this is no longer a no-knock. Knock and announce. And fortunately, I took a picture of the board that said knock and announce because nobody believed. For some reason, in 2020, nobody believed cops. Okay. Doesn't matter how, I mean, you know, you can have a career criminal and seven cops at the door, which is what we were. <clears throat> and somehow, they're believing the career criminal. So it was a knock and announce. We went up and I knocked on the door. Nobody came. Knocked again. Nobody came. And I knew somebody was in there because we pulled up. Her car was out front and the TV light was flashing. Okay. So we're like, she's probably in there. They told us there's no dogs, no children, no boyfriends, no weapons. So, okay, you kind of go with, you got to go with the intel you have from the people that Absolutely. gave it to you. Because again, we did nothing on this case. I show up, I go to the door again, knock, knock, nothing happens. Because they wanted her to cooperate. That was kind of the goal. Knock. Keep the neighbors out of it. Right. Slide in, talk to her, do what you got to do. She wouldn't come to the door. So then it started the, the police knock, the open hand, bang, 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 bang. Please search warrant. Please search warrant. Yelling that. This went on for about a minute, about seven different cadences of knocks. So that's a long time we're at a door. Absolutely. You know what I'm talking. It feels like an eternity. Um, so we're doing that. And on the last time I looked back at my lieutenant, he was like, go. So I told the, I told the breacher, I'm on the left. Breacher's on the right. The door swings from right to left. So he hits the door on the third hit, it flies open. At this point, everybody's on police search warrant. That's just what you do. Right. So I, I was able to clear the, the living room on the right-hand side before stepping in the fatal funnel. And when I ran out of real estate, I stepped. And as soon as I turned that corner down this long hall, I saw two objects overlapping one another. And it was bizarre because all the warrants I've done, you usually have people hiding, running, or yelling they're giving up yep. you know, where they can see you. Well, this was different. As I turn, my brain's, you know, you're, you're registering milliseconds. But man, everything's just capturing. And so I turn and my brain's going, something's off here. And boom, it was too late. When my, when my gun light got to his, I could see the, the tip of his silver gun. And as soon as I got there, boom, went off. Hit, felt the hit in my leg. I returned fire. And he dove out of the way. He dove into a room. Okay. He left her standing in the hall, unfortunately. She tried to follow him. But when she did is when she got struck with some of the crossfire. So let's dispel myth number one. Not in bed, yes. not a no knock. That's, that's two things right off the bat. Not the wrong apartment because you had Ben Crump, Kamala Harris, LeBron James all getting on national TV saying they weren't even at the right house. They had the wrong apartment. Right. So 
then when I look back at this, I, you know, at first I'm mad, naturally. I'm like, man, this is bull. They're not telling the truth. Why is everybody so mad at us? We were just there. I got shot, you know, first mm -hmm. before we turned for Why is everybody mad? And then I sat back and thought, man, if this happened in here, in this state, and I'm sitting at home, and all I see is they had the wrong apartment. She was in bed asleep. Cops came in and shot her in bed. And nobody refuted that. The department didn't. The city didn't. We had gag orders on us, so we couldn't talk. And this went on for months. Then the city pays $12 million before any, any right. court case goes on. And I'm thinking, I would think we were bad cops too. You know, sitting back, all the clues are pointing bad, 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 bad. And nobody, nobody is standing up going, wait a minute, no, here's the warrant. Her name's on it. The address is on it. Her car's on it. Her bank account's on it. Everything's on it. You know, uh, she was in the hallway. She wasn't in bed. <clears throat> and when, when you don't get any of that back, it's so frustrating as, as a cop to sit back and just get punched in the face and punched in the face and punched in the face. Absolutely. So finally, when the state AG decided not to indict us, I finally had the chance to talk. Number one, I had about 20 years in, so I could retire. So I knew the department didn't want me to talk. Right. And so, but I said, you know what? Somebody's got to talk. If they're not, and my mayor, who's a progressive piece of crap who hates the police anyway. Okay. I mean, we'd gone like five or six years without a contract. He just didn't like the police. So he had already gotten on TV and said, man, we need justice for Breonna Taylor. If I could fire these guys today, I would. So he was anti-cop. He yeah. didn't like us. So I said, you know what? Somebody's got to talk. And it's not just for me. You know, these other guys, they're going through it too. Their families are. And that's the problem. We as cops, man, we're kind of calloused. We're kind of used to this stuff. Yes. But when your family goes through it, yeah. when they get the threats. We're beating dogs. Yeah. But so, let me let me stop you for a quick second. Yeah. So... When we had our conversation the other night on the phone, I, you know, I said to you personally, yeah, I'm a little ignorant of this matter because because of Amud Arbery and then, of course, subsequently George Floyd. Right. And this was kind of caught in the vacuum in the middle. Right. Um, the myths that we're dispelling right now. Um, how long was it before you were allowed to speak after this incident occurred? The first time I spoke was, I think, to Michael Strahan in October. So you go up from March to October. You had wow. all six months of nothing but this thing just <clears throat> brewing up yeah. and, and festering and, and people just it just piling on. All the celebrities, all the athletes, all the politicians. And the problem with the, the, the Strahan interview was what little of it I saw I could stomach. It wasn't an interview. It was an interrogation. Oh, and from the go, we, we met up in Ohio because of COVID. Couldn't go to New York, couldn't come to Kentucky. We met up in Ohio. We go in this, this rented house. <clears throat> they mic me up, they mic him up, there's no introduction. We sit down and it's go time. I feel like I was on the defense stand. I mean, it was just, he was just coming at, coming at for three hours, three and a half hours straight, no break, no anything. Just go, 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 go. And actually when it, it's funny, and he would never admit this, but there was people around. When it was over, he said, you know, I actually like you, except for the fact you're a Cowboys fan. Yeah. And, but then the next morning on TV just totally dogged me. Yeah, and that, that's, you know, that's kind of what bothered me because, like I said, you know, forgive me for my ignorance about the case, but learning more about it and then watching just a small clip of, of a long story and going, God, you, it, it's kind of like putting me in a room and just saying to me, hey, go get him. He's the bad guy. Make him look good. Don't give him a chance to talk. Just hit him with all this stuff. Hit him with racial epithets. Yeah. Make him look like he's a racist police officer. Which, unfortunately, that was the vacuum at the time. Right. And, and, and you you had a, a, an unfortunate incident at the absolute worst time. Oh, um, yeah, absolutely. I said, man, if this happened in 2018, you wouldn't know me. It would have been a bump in our careers or in the road. And, and things just kind of would have went away. They just would have. Yeah. And, and you were, you know... You know, my opinion. You know, the Amud Arbery case spoke for itself. Oh, yeah. You know, boom. George Floyd, a lot of people still have questions about it. I have my own beliefs about it. That's immaterial. But it all was a part of a, a mandate that was being put out there, promulgated by the media. Mm -hmm. And a lot of police departments at that time were pandering because they didn't want to deal with the backlash. So instead of protecting an officer, they put him out to the walls. And the sad thing is I reached out to my department and I was like, when are we going to put the truth out? Because none of this is happening. And their response was, we don't want to set precedent for future cases. <clears throat> and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you'd rather our city burn than set a precedent? I said, you guys change precedent at the whim anyway. Anything that works for you, you change it. But when it comes to people that you're not invested in or who aren't part of the good old boys club, you just kind of push them to the side and let them burn. Right. Um, never arrested. No. 
that right. charge didn't violate any policy? That's important to know because uh, a lot of this stuff was, you know, was what the media put out there. You know, my knowledge of it, what limited, like I said to you, was, was, oh, Breonna Taylor was killed. She was sleeping. She was in the hallway. I don't know. Even when I taught, when I teach, when someone had mentioned, I said, I can't comment on what I don't know because there was so much misinformation because if you don't have concrete facts, then you're misinformed. Right. And every time I talk about this, I'm like, look, this isn't anti Breonna Taylor. She was a victim in all this, too. There's no doubt. You know, she's she's come from, came from a home where her dad's been in prison her whole life. Her mom didn't raise her. Her grandma did. Um, her grandma died, and then her mom kind of came back into her life. And so these dope dealers, and you've seen it, man, they prey on these type of women who don't have a father figure, who are looking for love, looking for acceptance. Yep. And Jamarcus Glover had like four women in his life that he was using all of them at different different parts for his, his own benefit. Um, so she was used in that way. Um, she was a victim in this. Here, Kenneth Walker had a minute to respond to us, come to the door, got dressed, got a gun, stood and wait, and for some reason brought her in the hall with him. I have no idea. Instead of saying, hey, I really, if, if I really think I'm getting broken into, why don't you, why don't you hang back and call 911? Right. I'll take care of this. Then leaves her, hung out to dry, didn't help her, he had no blood on him. And then when he comes out on video, says she's the one that shot. Right. Just a coward, man. That's, all, that's the only way you can put it. Yeah, and, it, and again, if there is a, a misinformation case on this planet, this is the one. Yeah. And again, like I said, in the worst possible time for law enforcement as a whole. Right. You know, because at this point, people were, you know, getting frustrated. And then, of course, the race card was thrown in. Um, what? Let's dispel that. Yeah. Because I want to go back to what you just said about Breonna Taylor. I don't think people understand what you just said. She was a victim in mm -hmm. life. That does not sound like a racist law enforcement officer who has no compassion. So let's talk about her a little bit more even, you know, like about this whole incident. How are your feelings about this? I want people to know this. We want people to know this. I'll tell you this. When I woke up in the hospital, my wife is there. The very first thing I asked her, I went, was anybody else hurt? I knew the police weren't hurt because when I was on my back and they're doing the tourniquet because it hit my femoral artery. Sure. I, I remember accounting for everyone. I knew who was around me. You? Oh, yeah. They hadn't had a tourniquet. I've been dead. Yeah. Carry a tourniquet. Okay. Um, so... I, I knew all the police were good, but I had no idea what happened in that apartment. It happened so quick. And once those gunshots shots started, it's like strobe light. And it's hard to it's hard to zone in on anything. I know we do all the practice. We do all the things. But once the real-life scenario comes, it's a different pace. It just is. Um, and my wife said, yes, yeah, somebody died. And I remember going, who? And she said, a female. And my heart just sunk. Um, because my fear my entire career wasn't getting hurt, wasn't dying. It was hurting someone that was innocent, didn't deserve it. And that's the point in my career that I had dreaded, and it happened. Yeah. yeah. What happened to the other officers for people who didn't follow the case outside of the, the general media exposure? So the guy who, who when I went down, like kind of stepped over me <clears throat> and put the rounds in, his, and unfortunately, his is the one that killed her. Um, he got found not guilty. They, they, he said he violated policy because some of his shots were wild. Um, so he got fired, but he didn't get charged. Um, Brett Hankinson, and this is one that people. Wait, I'm sorry. What policy did he violate? They said he didn't uh, acquire a proper target because he Kenneth had dove out of the way. Uh, and but again, I'm, these I'm things are happening. Right. I was going to yeah. say. I'm assuming it's someone who's never actually had someone shooting at them who wrote that policy. Yeah. Well, the, well, the guy who did the investigation recommended I get fired. I shouldn't have shot back. I'm going. Wait a minute. I just got <laughs> shot, and I'm looking at the guy. How you know? How does this not work? But, um, but this is this is a guy they had stuck in in that unit. Who was a known coward, and and even during the protest, they put him over a group of people, which was hilarious. And in the first two hours, he had a mental breakdown. They got a picture of him crying by the car. I've got it. And uh, <laughs> and and but what did they do? So they let him off on mental leave. Okay, he should be because he shouldn't be down there with riots Correct. if he can't handle it. Yeah, of course. When they brought him back, guess where they put him? He was over the guys using force down the riots, judging them on whether they should have used force or not. So Come that just on. tells you the lack of leadership we have in some of these positions, or lack of forethought. Where you're looking, going, okay, this guy couldn't handle it, but he's going to judge the guys who can. You know, it, it's just a weird time to be a cop. It just is. And that's the problem with, you know, with leadership in law enforcement. We know that. Or lack of. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. what I mean. We're only as strong as the leaders that we have in place because you will do an action. But if there's nobody there to stand up for your actions, if they're justified, then you're in trouble. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And again, we're in this weird state where unless it's captured on body cam, they don't believe you. 
Like, what did we do before body cams? You know, yeah. were the police always wrong? Yeah, it, it doesn't make sense. So did anyone end up, he got fired. He got fired, okay, the other guy. <clears throat> what happened, he swung around. He was the third one in, in the stack coming in. He said, because I asked him, I'm like, dude, why'd you shoot on the outside? Because if, if you know anything about it, you've got the door here where me and the one guy shot. He circled around and shot through some windows. He said that when he was the third one up, he saw the flash from the darkness come. He saw me shoot back, and he couldn't get in the doorway because someone else said, you can't have three in the doorway. He backed out, starts to button hook around the front. But when he did, he heard the second guy shots. He shot 16. I shot six times. The second guy shot 16. So he unloaded his, his gun. And that happened in about four seconds. People think, oh, 16 shots. It's boom, 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 It's done. Yep. And as that's happening, that's all he hears in this in this echo of a small area. Sure. He thinks the guy inside is still shooting. So he's like, man, they're getting executed at the doorway. That was his mindset. I've got to do something to get this guy to quit shooting. So he shot through the window, um, and he ended up getting charged on a state level. Uh, got acquitted because once the jury, and we're in a, like I said, a super liberal city. Yeah. I thought, man, he's done. They're going to just hang him out because they're not fans of the police. But when they got in that in that room and they heard the actual facts, they acquitted him within two hours, wow. which is unheard of. Um, there was a fed in the room as he walked, as they acquitted him, he walked by him and said, this ain't over yet. And they indicted him and they shopped around to indict him. I don't, I, I heard five or six times they presented it to a federal grand jury before they got the outcome they wanted, which I didn't know they could do that. Um, and so he got indicted. We went to trial last year and it was a mistrial, 10 to acquit, two to, to found guilty. And so they're retrying him again in October. That's insane. And they added a civil rights violation to it, which could put him in life for prison, or prison for life, when his bullets hurt no one. That's the amazing thing. What I don't understand, though, so he was acquitted. Uh, how, how does double jeopardy not apply? State and federal are different, different statutes. Same charge, basically, but they name it under something else to get around it. Yeah. That's crazy. I can't it's believe that not, hasn't been tried as unconstitutional yeah. at this point. How about let's let's uh, let's go over to the media side because I, I this is why I do this, okay? Because I'm so tired of people blowing steam, puffing up their chest, yeah. putting out their mandates without knowing what the hell they're talking about. They're ruining people's lives. Yeah, you know I, I take the neutral ground because I want what's true, and that's why I'm so happy that it makes you got you on the side. <laughs> yeah, it helped me in my career, but it helps me in life too. And I think people need to understand that this crap about slandering people doing stuff. Do you know these people? Do you know what's going on? Do you know you? Do right. you know that you have a family, that you have kids? Stop this madness, you know? But I think that the timeliness of this, as we said again, was in the worst time for law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And you look at the list of celebrities who jumped on board against you. Well, guess what? Television ratings. More people checking yes on uh Instagram, more people liking your LinkedIn, more people liking garbage. Yeah. It's garbage because your life is much more important because they move on to something else. Oh, yeah. But you have to live with that. Yeah. And, and that's tragic. Yeah, like, <clears throat> and this is just one example because it, it'd be so much easier to list the few celebrities who didn't jump on board or athletes as opposed to who did because I've got a file of hundreds, if not thousands. Um, and you would know all the names. Sure. You sit back and even some of them, I was like, wow, they feel that way? You know? I like them. Shoot, yeah. check them off the list. But if you start doing that in life, you won't watch anything or do anything. Because I quit watching sports for a while because it didn't matter what sport it was. When it was on during that time period, I was brought up, or the yeah. case was. Sure, absolutely. And and called us so many things. And like Tampa Bay Buccaneers and the Tampa Bay, um, who were the Bay Rays, they put up big signs on their opening day, arrest the murderers who killed Rihanna Taylor and all this. And I'm going, I can't watch any sport anymore. Wow. So I would just turn it off and say, I'm done with it for a while. No, and we, you know, in law enforcement, we learned to take it, yeah. you know, right or wrong. I mean, listen, when Memphis happened, that was awful. Was However, when I'm taking a, a, you know, I'm in Boston in a bar watching it, but really crying, and this lady looks over at me, the bartender, she says, you want a job? <laughs> I said, I was. She goes, so is my husband. He's home crying too, because oh. we're like disgusted. Yeah. But then the next day, I at the same place, just trying to watch a basketball game to, to you know, relieve myself from what's going on, the pressures. And here they are talking about it, slandering all cops. And it's the understanding has got to be more doctors kill people than police officers. Oh, 250,000 medical malpractice deaths a year. Right. But yet when a police officer does something, there's a rush to judgment without the facts. 
if you're not in handcuffs and under arrest right away, that still doesn't mean you're right because it just means they haven't done a quick, they've just done a quick pro quo investigation. Right. It's unfair. This is fair. You being here is fair. It's about fairness. It's about treating our officers with the respect and the dignity that they deserve. So let me tell you, man, in terms of the media, so that is why I do what I do today because I work in the media. I was trained in how to make cops look bad. It was literally part of our training. And my breaking point, um, I don't really feel like getting sued, so I'm not going to name names here, but I was working for a big national TV station. I was a producer of news and special projects, and I was sent to a training program. It was all expenses paid. I was a young man. I was in my early 20s. I was stoked. They were flying me across the country, putting me up. And so the very first thing that we did, they showed us this news clip that had gone massively viral. And they said, we're going to show you the clip, and then we're going to show you how it was made. So they show us this clip, and it's, it's this uh, unarmed black man gets shot in the back by a white cop clearly murdered it like it wasn't even a question you watch that video and you knew that black dude got murdered by that cop so i'm pissed right i'm like how how did he just do that that i can't the south carolina one where he pitched his taser so he got his taser no this was different so and this was back in 2007 maybe um and and the video i've been a few years old at this point so I'm mad. I'm like, I, I cannot believe what I just watched. That is disgusting. Like, clearly, that must have been racism. There's no other explanation. So then they said, now we're going to show you how the video was made. And they show us the body cam footage that did not make the news. And in the body cam footage, you see this big black dude, almost 300 pounds, six foot five, high on PCP, running at the officer with a butcher knife over his head. And at the last second, the officer's ready in motion. Gun's coming up. He goes to stab him and he drops the knife and turns, and he gets shot. It happened like that. I mean, we replayed it a whole bunch of times. It was a totally good shoot. There was zero question. So now I'm really pissed, right? I'm like, we lied to everybody. You went massively viral and got that reaction out of people like me who even do this for a living, thinking that, that this was a racist act and that he murdered an unarmed dude. But that's not even close to what happened. The reality of what happened is the complete opposite. Totally good shoot. And I remember the pastor who was teaching that part of the course looked at me and said, son, if you want to make it in this business, you better learn how to tell a good story. And I was like, well, guess what, dude? <laughs> I don't want to make it in this business. And so it was back then in my early 20s that, I mean, I was such a pompous ass. I was like, I'm going to change this. I'm going to change the entire media. One day, one day I'm going to fix this. And so flash forward, we, we have the opportunity to have this unbelievable partner on the show that we can tell these stories and we can show what really happened because your story has not been told by the mainstream media. You have been lied about. You, you were that officer who shot that unarmed black man in this particular case. Your story was buried and it's, it's an honor. Do you want to hear the thing that would make you real sick? So there's two things, well, there's several, but two that, that from that particular incident, one is the guy who shot me, they dropped the charges because they said, you know, he didn't know we were the police. Right. That's right. right. Yeah. Okay. Let's play devil's advocate and pretend like he really thought he was getting robbed. Okay. That's fine. Well, then the city paid him $2 million for his emotional damage. The mom took out a hit on us. She's part of a black motorcycle club from Sin City that came in from Chicago. They took a hit out on our families. We had to get moved in the middle of the night. This was corroborated by the FBI from three different informants that didn't know each other. One of them was embedded in the club on an OSADEF case already buying guns from him. For a federal informant. The FBI takes over the case and they didn't like the way the perception looked. They said, this looks bad nationally to go after a victim's, a black victim's mother. So they dropped the case. And so I'm thinking, man, I thought you were on our side. And the agents that were running it, uh, it's not them. I mean, seriously, the guy, the boots on the ground there too. Most of them are decent guys. Um, they were mad, but the upper echelon people shut it down, and then he gets promoted to DC. So it's just a it's just a, a dirty world we live in, man. Anytime you make a determination about anything based on the color of someone's skin, regardless of what the color of that skin is, regardless of who's involved, if you are making a decision based on the color of someone's skin, that is racist. Period. Like that is the definition of true racism. A guy being shot and then officers shooting back without even 
knowing what a person looks like, that is not racism <clears throat> determining we're not going to press charges against someone. I don't care if they're black or white or Hispanic or Asian, it doesn't matter based on what they look like. That, that is perpetuating this cycle that we have and this divisiveness in society. Go after criminals, yeah. period. Not that hard. There's a lot of them. No. And we can't be afraid as, as law enforcement to do what we're supposed to do. Because mm -hmm. you were coming off a case, the Emily Arbery case, which was disgusting. This was a chance to show people that this was not a race issue. It was, tragic. It was a tragic, yeah. tragic incident on all sides. And one of the things I always say when I teach to people, I tell my officers all the time, when you get up in the morning and you, you're God blessed to do what you do and you put your uniform on, you put your gun belt on, what is the one thing you hope you don't have to do that day? That is discharge your firearm with. Because no matter what anyone says to you, when you've done it, right or wrong, it's got to be incredibly very difficult when you are a part of someone dying. Yeah, so fun. Yeah. How's the healing? And in, in so many different ways, the physical healing, the, the emotional healing from it. The, I'm sure you've replayed this a million times. Like, how's the healing? How are so you doing? So the physical part, <clears throat> I was fortunate, man. Um, I'll be honest. I, I'm pretty much back to normal. You're it, shredded, dude. You yeah, look good. It, thanks. It didn't take me long because I worked hard to get my leg back. It's still numb, uh, but it's just nerve damage. It won't come back. Um, the, the emotional part was more the betrayal by the department than the media and, and all the fools out there who just didn't know. You know, again, they were deceived like everybody else. I understand the emotions got a hold of them. I get that. So I'm not, I'm necessarily mad at them. Um, it's, it's the city and the department that I served that I was willing to die for that just totally turned their back on me. That's the hard part to deal with. So I had to, I had to decide one day. I remember my wife and I were driving <clears throat> and where we moved is very uh, rural. And, you know, we come from a city my whole life to, you know, the country. And, and the thing that bugs me the most about the country are the slow drivers. Because <laughs> being a cop in the city, you're you're this. You know what I'm saying? It's nonstop. Go, right. go, 100 miles an hour. And now I'm sitting nowhere to be, but I'm white knuckling it behind an 80-year-old lady because she's going 10 below the speed limit. And there's no way to get around her. And I'm just like, come on, man. What are you doing? Finally, one day my wife looks at you. Why are you so mad? And I'm like, I'm not mad. I just want this person to go. I just want to do the speed limit. That's all I want. Well, 10 over would be nice, but the speed limit would be great. And so... <laughs> And, and then it clicked. I'm like, man, maybe I am. Maybe these little things really mean nothing, but this is the way I'm displaying what I'm feeling inside. And so I had to make a conscious decision that said, I'm not going to be bitter. I'm not going to be mad. I'm not going to live because it's stealing from me. It's stealing from my happiness, for my family's happiness. And once I decided that, it was a game changer because even though I had masked it and acted like things were good, I knew inside what I felt, you know. And so uh, but when I did that, and it's a daily decision. It's not you just do it once and you flip the switch and you're done. Because there's times, like, especially when I go back to where my adult kids and parents live, and then I have to go two hours back, and it ends up being a day thing for just a couple of hours to see the people I love. I get mad because that wasn't my decision. You know, we were forced to move out because of all the death threats. And so it's like, then I have to check myself again and go, all right, now I'll look at the positives. You know, kids in a great school, he's in sports, do, all, thriving, all these things. So quit dwelling on these things that you can't control anymore. And just enjoy what you got. And that's that's the main thing that's helped me. I've watched um, guys who have been shot, who have very quick recoveries, don't deal with any PTS. I've not had any. It's weird. But then I've seen guys who have witnessed officers get shot who who have severe PTS. And I think obviously everybody's different, right? People have different life experiences, childhood experiences, different traumas in their life. Um for, for the people who are going through it or the people who don't even realize that they're going through it, what what advice can you give them about healing and, and a road to not holding on to resentment? Everybody's, everybody's different. Everybody's trauma is their own. Um, and it's easy to sit back and judge and go, well, I had a bigger role in this. My face was everywhere. I got injured. I got shot. Why are you so upset about it? Your name wasn't anywhere, but there's, there's a guy in particular who just had a real tough time with it. And originally, I was judgmental. And then I had to go, whoa, 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 whoa. Whatever he felt or did or went through, maybe it was guilt for not stepping up. I have no idea, but that's not my problem. I just got to let him deal with his thing. Um, and so everybody's got their own journey they're going to have to go through and figure it out. And so what worked for me may not work for them, but counseling's big. You know, in this cop world, we're all 
too macho to go get help. You know, we help people. We don't need help. Uh, we're fixers. We don't need to be fixed. But then they go drink or you have extra affairs or you gamble or you do all these, these self-destructive things because you're trying to fill that void. Um, and so I would just say, talk to people you love. Don't isolate. Uh, get help and and turn to God. That's my big thing. That was the big, you know, my dad was a pastor, so I was raised in a Christian home. My foundation is God. I'm not a great Christian, but that's my foundation. Um, so when the, those burdens would get so heavy that I felt like I was just drowning, I would go, God, please take them. And you wouldn't take them off because when all the burdens are gone, what happens? We forget about God, right? Yep. Yeah. We're just like, and it's not on purpose, but it's not our focus because now everything's good. Um, so when those trials and tribulations come, that's that's usually the first place to turn. Yeah, and we were, we were talking about this before, um, a few minutes before we went on camera. PTS resiliency is a new concept. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I just, oh man, so sorry for what you went through. If he hears that a hundred times, he may have the strength to come out of it on his own. But if we keep telling him that, then it starts to create an issue, right? Sure. Yeah, if everybody's telling me I got a problem, I must have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, word, word of advice to our friends, our loved ones is, you know, when somebody you know and love goes through it, help them get out of it. Don't encourage them to keep reminiscing. It. Let them be resilient. Hey, man, I, I'm sorry for what you went through. I, I don't even understand what you went through, but you're going to get through this. You know, give them supportive words. Don't just cower to what we tend to do. You know, we go for comfort instead of wellness. And we have to start reaching for wellness because it's so important for people. Because what's the number one killer of cops? Suicide. Suicide, right? So we have to, we've got to change that model. You're, we are broken being cops. We know that. Yeah. You know, you're broken the first minute you put on the uniform and go out there because you see stuff that nobody else should see. That's why we do what we do. But I know in my career to stay healthy is like you said, to talk about it when I teach I tell my class about my worst day and I, some days I can do it. And some days I'm crying while I'm doing it yeah. because the death of a three-year-old kid was more than I could take that particular day. And that's okay because when I go to bed at night, I don't relive it over and over again. Right. And it's okay if you do, but let the people around you, you know, be supportive of your person. Don't treat them like they're wounded. Don't treat them like they're broken. Love them. Do you know Randy Sutton? Mm -hmm. Wounded Blue. Wounded Blue, yeah. So I, I went to his first conference. I think it was three years ago now. And I'm sitting there. And this isn't too long after the event. This I think in September. So it was right around the time we got, I think, not charged. Um, and I'm there listening. And and I started. he started honoring a few people that whose departments had just totally turned their back on. And so I'm sitting back there watching. And there's this lieutenant from a very small department. I don't even know where it is from. But I just remember they said it was a small department. And he was chasing a, I think, a bank robbery suspect, two of them. He's in his SUV and he's behind them. And the passenger turns around and shoots with an AR and hits him in the head. Gears off the road, flips his car. He's alive, but he's not the same. I mean, he's mentally challenged now and can't really speak. And so when he went through that, his department was fighting with workman's comp on who's going to pay. Well, this guy ends up going bankrupt, losing his house. And then the department goes, I wouldn't need you anymore. Go away. Yep. And I'm sitting back going, I don't have it that bad. <laughs> right. You know, I'm not right. that guy. So what am I, what am I self-loathing about? Why am I complaining? Yeah. I've got it great compared to this guy. So, uh, I mean, Randy's doing good stuff. And, and so I appreciated that. And there was all kinds of stories, but I'm thinking if we're in this little bitty room and there's this, how many are there nationwide that have stories that you'll never hear about? You know, I've, I've often been a believer that the, the whole saying, God doesn't give you more than you can handle. It's such BS. God intentionally gives us more than we can handle so that we remember who we're supposed to turn to. So, brother, shameless plug time. Book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 12 Seconds in the Dark. I've uh, got one for each of you. You can get it on Amazon. It's basically um, the story up to the time I wrote the book of what happened. It's got the truth in it. It's got some facts. It's got documentation. Uh, so you can see I'm not just blowing smoke up your butt. Get it on Amazon. It's the easiest place or cheapest place to get it right now because it's on sale. But uh, go get it. Give it to your friends who have the the doubt, the self-doubt, or the anti-police rhetoric, give it to them and say, hey, just read this. If you don't like it, throw it away. I don't care. Use it to wipe your butt. Who cares? But there you go. 12 seconds in the dark. Awesome. There you go. Guys, check it out. Any parting thoughts? Yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna secondly endorse this book because you know what? <clears throat> I didn't know a lot about this, admittedly. Um, and now I do. I know more. I know from the person who was there. 
you know, and I get the is thank you. I get to see your heart. I get to see your compassion. You know, that's not was not put out there. Yeah. And, and I hope that we were able to illuminate the fact that you are an amazing human being. Thank you. And I am blessed for this moment in time with you and the time that we've had together today. So thank you so thank much. You, Absolutely, brother. Sarge, we own the largest police news outlet in the world, and we didn't know all the details. We reported on this story again and again, and we didn't know all the details. So if that doesn't tell you the, the deficit in communication that we have in society right now to tell the truth, I don't know what does. So, brother, thanks for coming on the thank show, man. You. God thank bless. You. Guys, thank you all so much for watching this episode. Thank you for hitting that share button. God bless you all. God bless America. Love you, Mom.